Hello and welcome back. This is the week 14 lecture. So today I want to talk about sort of the next step in the writing process for us. So I've already kind of talked about this in the conferences <laughs> that most of you attended last week. So a lot of this might sound familiar, but I want to be clear for everyone kind of where we are right now here in week 14. So at this point, we need to start working on rough drafts if we haven't already. So I know we're all kind of at slightly different stages of this larger process. Perhaps some of you got started on your rough drafts uh, last week after our conference. Maybe some of you got moving over the weekend. That's great. But if you haven't gotten started yet, on drafts. It's time to get started here early in week 14. So I've already given you pretty much all the information that you need inside the week 14 module in the overview. So we're kind of doing two things this week. We are working on rough drafts, we are starting to put together rough drafts, and we are also trying to conduct some peer review. So I've already kind of talked with, about peer review with a lot of you, uh, and as I've pointed out, it can be a little tricky with online classes. But if you go to the week 14 overview, you see that I've already paired everybody up, so I've assigned everyone a peer review partner. Uh, so it's very simple. We're going to do this strictly through email. In the past, I've tried to use Canvas's uh, peer review function. It works pretty well once people actually get used to it, but there's some there's some instructions that you have to follow. It can be a little bit uh, difficult. It's not really intuitive, and I just find that a lot of people don't want to deal with it. You have to kind of read the instructions. You have to follow a very <laughs> specific set of steps. So we're not going to do all of that. It just seems like too much unnecessary hassle. So instead, we're going to do this through email. So you see the first and last name of your peer review partner. That should be the only info you need. If you type that name into your Canvas email search box, your partner should come up. Uh, we're going to just stick with GBC email. I don't expect you guys to you know, use your personal emails. Just use GBC because it's easy to find another student that way. So just put in the name and you should see the email address of your partner pop up. Okay, but that's why I included last names because I know a lot of you don't personally know each other, but that's okay. You don't have to ever meet in person. Uh, you can do all of this through email. So like I said in the overview, our schedule looks like this. I'm recording this on Monday night. Most of you are not going to see it until Tuesday. So by Tuesday, you need to have already gotten some kind of a start on your rough draft. And we're prepared to do this because we already have outlines. We've already completed our finished bibliography, at least most of us have. So you have your sources, you have your outline, you've already gotten feedback from me about your proposal. So at this point, we've done a lot of the pre-writing, we've gotten organized, we have our sources, so it's time to move on to the next stage of the writing process, which is, of course, drafting. And we know that. So now we can take our outlines. Don't forget about the outlines. Just because you've submitted it, don't forget about it. As you get started on the rough draft, you need to have your outline open available, easily accessible. You need to be looking at it as you get started on your draft. Because as I've said a lot, uh, our outline is supposed to contain individual plans for each one of the paragraphs that we intend to write. So now that it's time to actually start writing your paragraphs, you need the plans. So I always use my kind of goofy building a house metaphor when we think about writing papers we should think about building a house so if the outline is the blueprint uh, obviously we're going to need that blueprint now that we're ready to actually start building 
So have the outline handy, and now it's just time to start putting together the paragraphs that you've planned. And we're going to find out if our plan was good. <laughs> we're going to find out if we planned enough paragraphs. And it's not really a big deal if you didn't plan quite enough. So as I was looking over outlines last week to get ready for conferences, I noticed that, you know, as is usually the case, all outlines are different and everybody outlines in different ways. So some of you had really good detailed outlines and it almost looked like you had started plugging in uh, claims of your own evidence from your sources into some of those paragraphs. So some of you had actually already started to write some of those paragraphs. That's great. Others just had a basic idea for what the paragraph would be about. Uh, maybe a quick note about a source or two that you were planning on using in that paragraph, and then you move on. That's okay. Outlines don't have to be super detailed. Everybody has their own style. So it's fine if you didn't plug in a lot of stuff into those plans. But now, if you didn't plug a lot in, now is the time to start writing your own sentences and actually putting the substance into these paragraphs. But I also noticed that some of you planned like seven or eight or nine bodies. And that's great. You're going to need roughly that many. And then I saw others only planned maybe four <laughs> or maybe three bodies. And that's okay. That's not going to lose you any points on the outline. Just be aware, and I think most of us are aware, that for a paper of this length, you're going to need more than three or four body paragraphs. I can just guarantee that. I don't have to look at any of your work to tell you that you need to plan more than three or four bodies. Now, you don't have to go back to the outline necessarily. You can do some of this planning, some of this work as you draft. But I always tell people, go ahead and write what you have planned first. Take your outline and go ahead and write all the paragraphs that are planned in the outline. Don't worry just yet as to whether or not you have enough. Just write what you've already planned, what you've already thought about on the outline. Go ahead and write all of those paragraphs, the intro, the definition paragraph, as many body paragraphs as you planned, maybe a policy paragraph, and certainly a concluding paragraph at the end. Maybe you haven't planned that yet. Maybe you're not quite ready to write that yet. But go ahead and try to write as many of the paragraphs as possible that you've already planned, that you've already thought about, and then just see where you are in terms of length, in terms of, you know, how good the stuff looks that you've just written. Let's kind of take stock once we've kind of followed our initial plan on the outline, go ahead and write those paragraphs, and then we can see if, you're, uh, if you have enough content, if your body paragraphs are working, and if you need to add more, if you need to make some adjustments, of course, you'll have time to do that. A little bit later. So the key when you're when you're drafting, a lot of students get hung up on sort of little things, not little, but things that you don't necessarily need to worry about right now. So a lot of kids get hung up on the length requirement. They get hung up on a particular quote sandwich or, uh, you know, things that we have time to fix later. The focus when you're putting together a rough draft is to basically get all of your ideas, all of your plans down on paper in complete sentences and complete paragraphs. So you see the progression. Earlier, when we were just pre-writing, we were just jotting ideas down. We were being very informal. And even with the outline, we were continuing, in many cases, to be informal. Sentence fragments bullet points, I kind of want to do this, I'm not really sure, fine, that's all fine. But now we're drafting. Now we're actually building complete sentences, complete paragraphs, and we need to put everything uh, in its proper place. But we don't need to worry that everything's perfect. We don't need to make sure that everything is ready for final submission. 
because we're not submitting final drafts yet. First, we have to develop rough drafts. So, again, different people will do this at different rates, but by the middle of the week, we need to at least have working drafts. So a complete rough draft would be great. If you have a complete rough draft by Wednesday, you are a little bit ahead of the game. And that's, that's wonderful. But if you at least have a working draft, that means you have started a rough draft. You haven't necessarily finished it, but you have started it. And a working draft will feature many paragraphs. Maybe not all of your future paragraphs, but we need to see an intro or at least something that passes for an intro paragraph so we can see your topic, so we can see your thesis. Uh, we need to see a couple of body paragraphs. <laughs> you know, um, Maybe not all of the bodies are there yet, but we need to at least see some of them. Uh, it would be great to see your policy paragraph if you've gotten to that yet. However, the concluding paragraph, while it would be nice to see, if it's not there, that's okay. Um, you know, that's kind of to be expected at this point. We might not be ready to finish, but we've certainly gotten a start. So by Wednesday, even if you just have a working draft, you will be ready to participate in peer review. So we're going to try to get peer review started on Wednesday, May the 5th, as I say in the overview. So it's very simple. Just by the end of the day on Wednesday, try to email your draft to your partner. All right. And if you look in the overview right underneath all the partner listings, I have some peer review questions that I would like you guys to answer in relation to your partner's draft. I've tried to keep the questions very simple, very basic, kind of brief, uh, because I know we're busy and I know we don't want to write a novel in response to our classmates' draft. So just try to answer those questions and you can put your answers wherever. At the end of the paper, uh, if there's some blank space, you can just type your answers in uh, if that works for you. You can also provide the answers in the body of the email that you send to your classmate when you are returning your classmate's draft. So I've attached your draft. I've made a few comments on it, but here are my answers to your questions. They can just be in the email or you guys can communicate in whatever way works for you. Some of you do know each other. I've, I've tried to pair you up with people that you know when possible, but I also kind of got mixed up and I forgot some of the proposed partnerships that I discussed with some of you last week. So I think I got some of the pairs wrong because frankly, I didn't always write those down. I thought I could remember them and I was proven wrong. So I apologize if I gave anybody a partner that I wasn't, if I gave you like the wrong partner or if I told you that I was going to partner you with somebody else and then you see the list and you're not with the person that I said you would be with and you want to make a change, just email me. I'm not going to make any changes right now because nobody's told me to. But if you need me to make a change, I can make a change. Uh, but you need to talk to me soon, obviously. So, again, this is informal, and I want you guys to be comfortable. You know, you're, you're not going to be graded on providing, you know, the, the best feedback ever. But I do want you to CC me on the emails that you're sending to one another just so I can give you credit for participating in the peer review because this is part of our participation grade, which is a part of our overall grade. And we don't get a lot of chances to do participation stuff in an online class. So this is one of our few chances. So if you you know, want to get full credit for your participation grade, I need to see evidence that you are participating in peer review. Okay, so just CC me when you're kind of interacting or corresponding with one another, uh, not on every single email necessarily, if you're going to write a bunch, but, uh, you know, if you're sending your draft to your classmate, CC me on that email. 
And then uh, when you are returning your classmates draft with your feedback, you can CC me on that email as well. And I'm not necessarily going to read through every word. I'm just going to see that you did it, see that you're engaged, and I'll give you the full credit. Okay, but uh, try to keep me in the loop. And if you're having issues, if you're having problems, and especially if your classmate is not responding to you, <laughs> if, if your classmate is not returning your draft, not responding to your emails, let me know because I don't want you to suffer for that. Um, and if you want somebody to look over your draft and your classmate is just not doing it, I can be a good substitute peer review partner. So if your partner flakes out and will not help you, you can send your draft to me. Okay, now I'm not going to stick with the same peer review questions. Those are kind of, uh, you know, beneath me, frankly. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I'm going to kind of do it my own way, but I'll still provide you the feedback that you need. Okay, but and of course that option's available to anyone, even if your peer review partner did participate, but you want more feedback and you want feedback from somebody who might be able to tell you a little bit more about what's working and what's not, you can always send me a draft. But we always do this off the books, okay? So uh, I'm not going to be looking at your rough drafts in Canvas. If you want me to give you feedback on a rough draft, email me, okay? So I want to make that clear also. You are submitting rough drafts at the end of this week, but don't expect me to necessarily go through all of those drafts and give feedback. I'm only going to give feedback on the rough drafts that have major, major issues <laughs> or major problems because I'm going through those rough drafts fast. Again, that's largely a participation grade. Uh, it's a completion grade. I just want to make sure that everybody is doing rough drafts because a paper this size, it requires multiple drafts. So when you submit your rough draft, I would like you to have already uh, made some changes and made some revisions uh, based on the feedback that you got from your classmates. But that's not really do or die. So, you know, the schedule that I'm hoping we can stick with is that we start peer review on Wednesday and then we're done with it, hopefully by Friday. But I, I realize that that's a pretty tight window. So if you haven't gotten your draft back from your partner yet and it's time to submit the rough draft on Sunday night, just go ahead and submit the same rough draft that you gave your peer review partner previously. And even if you haven't had, a time, haven't had the time to really revise it or make any changes to it yet, that's okay. I just want to see that you have a rough draft and that you are working on it and that you're following my steps. And then you'll have more time after this week to make revisions to that rough draft and turn it into the final draft. In fact, you'll have a full week to do that. So rough drafts are due at the end of week 14, and then final drafts are due at the end of week 15, okay? So if you have any questions about any of this, I know it's a little bit weird, and we haven't really done this all semester, so it's new. If you have questions, if you're confused about anything, just let me know, okay? Let's talk. So I don't really have new material for you guys. I just posted basically all the peer review stuff. And if you scroll down to the bottom uh, of the overview, you'll notice that I've included a few additional writing templates. I just graded the rhetorical analysis assignment recently. And I noticed that some of us are struggling a little bit when we're trying to distinguish between what we say and what our sources say. And this is a very common problem on the research paper assignment because obviously you have a lot of sources, you're making a complex argument, and you're bringing in a lot of outside evidence that you have to kind of present and frame and cite, and it gets a little messy. Uh, it can get a little bit complicated. So uh, it's important that you're always being clear about what you're saying versus what sources are saying. 
So those templates that I've included in the week 14 overview, they're often called voice markers. They're ways to distinguish between different people's voices. And this might sound kind of weird, but it's really necessary for this assignment. Uh, because you're going to be presenting a lot of information from your sources. Sometimes you're going to be quoting your sources, and as we know, at other times, you might just be summarizing or paraphrasing your sources. But then at other times, you're going to be offering original claims, original points that come from you. And that needs to be clear. I need to know your ideas, and I need to be able to tell them apart from all the stuff that you're bringing in from your sources. Uh, again, this might seem obvious and most of us might be thinking, yeah, of course, I'm already doing that, but make sure that you are. <laughs> so go back to the rhetorical analysis assignment, take a look at my feedback. A lot of us are not always clearly introducing our sources. And then there's sometimes a lack of clarity when it comes to you know, the differences between what you're saying and what the sources are saying. So if you look at those sort of sample sentences, those templates that I've included, they're pretty simple. They're kind of similar to a lot of the sentences that we were writing with our charts back when we were analyzing and synthesizing our sources to get ready for the rhetorical analysis. So if you remember, after we did our charts that were all about the similarities and differences between the articles that we were using, our next step was to write kind of general statements about both or all three of the sources that we were working with at that particular time. So this was a way to begin synthesizing to begin kind of combining sources or at least being able to talk about multiple sources at the same time. So we wrote a lot of sentences like, while X says blank, Y claims blank. And then the third one says something else. So sentences like that, they're not complex. They're just ways to identify different viewpoints. And sometimes it's as easy as simply referring back to the author's name. We don't always do that. And a lot of us are, um, are not using the et all abbreviation when we have three or more authors. Remember, you don't have to list every author's name. We use the et all abbreviation, meaning and others, anytime we have three or more. Uh, and some of us are also introducing authors in our own sentences, last name first. Like this is an article written by Lackey Sam M. That's weird, okay? Don't do that. That's only the way that we have to present names in works cited citations. That's not how you introduce an author in a sentence of your own. Just think about the way you would introduce any person. Uh, in a normal situation, you wouldn't introduce me to other people that you know by saying, hey, this is Lackey Sam, right? You would go first name first and then last name. So that's the same policy with authors, right? The only time it's last name first is when you're writing a work cited citation. That's not what you need to do in a sentence of your own. Um so a lot of you need to kind of clarify the way that you're introducing your sources. Now on the research paper, you don't necessarily have to introduce every single source, but you are juggling a lot of sources and you are going to need to write some of those general statements where you're incorporating multiple sources. So in some of these new templates, I'm also giving you some chances to talk about what your sources are saying and then to pivot to talk about what you're saying. So that's kind of the whole idea. I'm pulling a lot of these templates from a book I like called They Say, I Say. And the whole kind of overall principle of the book is that students need to think about research papers as if they are entering a party. And <laughs> just bear with me, this does make sense if you think about it. So they say when a student is beginning to work on a research topic, uh, it's a lot like arriving late to a party. 
And yeah, you know some of the people at the party, but because you're late arriving, when you get there, everybody is already talking. Everybody's already having their own sort of conversations. And before you can enter into the conversation, any of the conversations, you have to wait and listen for a moment to get an understanding of what they're talking about. Like, what are they actually having a conversation about? So in this book, they say that's kind of like doing research. When you research, you're learning what other people have said. You're getting a sense of what the conversations are, the conversations that have already been going on long before you ever arrived at this topic. So that's what the research is. And after you've conducted the research, you've learned what people are saying. You've learned what's kind of going on. Now you can join the conversation. Now you can start offering your own views, your own opinions. So if you kind of think about it that way, a lot of these templates make sense because they're ways to say, all right, this guy says blank. This other guy disagrees and he claims blank and then I say the following so if you're not clearly navigating between this source that source this other source and you things get very confusing for the readers so that's why I've provided these additional templates so you don't have to use the ones that I've posted, but those are just the kinds of sentences that you need to write sometimes in your body paragraphs when you're working with evidence and when you want to make the transition from presenting evidence from your sources to then sharing your own ideas, your own opinions. And this is a move that we need to make pretty often, moving from source material to your own stuff. So remember, as you start building, and of course it's all related, right? But you have to be able to present your own original thoughts and sort of keep them distinct from your source material. So of course, proper in-text citations will help with that. Uh, handling quote sandwiches well will also help with that. But then writing some of these templates, using some of these templates will also help. Uh, so just remember when you're building your body paragraphs, uh, remember that sort of layer cake structure that I went through and I've posted my outline, uh, in the module. So you'll see that layer cake structure that I was talking about. A typical body paragraph, you know, begins with a topic sentence that you wrote that comes from you. And the topic sentence is announcing the supporting claim that you're going to be talking about, that you're going to be developing in that paragraph. We know that. But then we kind of follow up on that topic sentence with maybe another sentence or two written by us that might offer a little more detail and elaboration because topic sentences are often pretty general and kind of, in some cases, even a little bit vague. So we like to offer some follow-up. And then, after we've written the first two or three sentences of the paragraph ourselves, we can turn to evidence. We can turn to something from one of our sources, and we can bring it in. Maybe it's a direct quote. Maybe it's just an interesting claim that we want to paraphrase. Maybe it's some statistical stuff, some numerical evidence, a testimonial, whatever. Right, just bring in some evidence. If it's a if it's a quote, go ahead and write your quote sandwich. But as we know by now, whether we are quoting, summarizing, or paraphrasing this info from our source, we need to provide an in-text citation no matter what. And a lot of us did not use in-text citations in the rhetorical analysis. So please don't forget that it is imperative, it is essential, it is required that you use in-text citations when you are using evidence. So on some previous assignments, we didn't always use citations when we were summarizing because we were summarizing all the time. But now in the research paper, it becomes very important, again, that you distinguish between other people's stuff and your stuff. You see, if you summarize one of your sources for a few sentences, but then you don't cite it, 
you don't provide an in-text citation at the end of that summary, and then you just kind of launch into your own ideas, beginning in the very next sentence, how am I going to be able to tell where the summary ends and where your original material begins? I'm not going to be able to tell. If you're not quoting anything, it's often very easy to miss. If you're just summarizing or paraphrasing and not citing it, then you're kind of passing off a lot of those summaries and paraphrases as original material. And they're not. Obviously, the words are, are yours. That's why you don't have to put anything in direct quotes if you're just summarizing or paraphrasing. You don't have to put things in quote marks. The words are yours. But if you're summarizing something from your source, the ideas aren't yours. The research that's being presented in that source, that's not yours. You didn't do that. You didn't discover that. You didn't talk to those people uh, that the author's talking about. So that's where the citation really comes in. That's why it's so important, right? And again, that's part of what I'm talking about here, <laughs> making the distinction between what they say, they being your sources, and maybe even your opponents, the people that you're arguing against, uh, distinguishing between what they say and what you say. So that means templates and it means correct citations. It means following our MLA citation procedure. And just a warning, guys, if you don't have in-text citations on your research paper, I can't grade it. I just can't. You're violating MLA citation rules to such an extent that I can't even begin to evaluate the work. Okay, so citation, it's not optional. It's not, oh, I don't really feel like doing my citations. It's mandatory at this point. Okay, for the research paper, we don't have any wiggle room when it comes to citations. You either have them or you don't. <laughs> and if you don't have them, I can't grade your paper. So that goes for the in-text citations and the works cited page. If you don't have a works cited page, I will not grade your research paper. I cannot, uh, even if I wanted to. And I will not want to. But even if I did, I can't. I have to see your in-text citations and I have to see your works cited page. And they have to line up. Okay, uh, if you have 12 sources on your works cited page and only eight of them show up in in-text citations, that's a problem. Okay, that's going to cost you. So we'll talk a little bit more about citations next week, but just be aware as you start drafting and don't wait. This is a big thing. Even though I said with the rough draft, it can be rough. It's not going to be quite what you want. It might not even be 100% completed, but go ahead and start putting your citations in. A lot of students think, oh, I'm not going to worry about in-text citations on the rough draft. I'll just make sure that I'm doing them on the final draft. No, <laughs> no, don't do that. Okay, go ahead and get the in-text citations in now. Okay. Uh, and if you forget one or two, or if you've just done some of them wrong, that's not a huge deal. You can always fix them. But if you're not putting them in at all, that's going to cause you big problems later. You don't want to have to go back through the entire draft and figure out, okay, what source am I using here? Uh, what page number did this quote come from? You're going to have to go back and redo a lot of the work that you've already done. So as you're bringing in the evidence, as you're building your body paragraphs, go ahead and include the citations. Every time you bring in evidence, uh, every time you quote something, every time you summarize or paraphrase something, go ahead and provide the in-text citation in parentheses. Even if it's not 100% correct, just having it there is a good start. And you can always clean it up and fix whatever problems might exist a little bit later. But if you're just if it's not there, then you're just gonna make it harder on yourself later. Okay. So let me know if you have any citation related questions. I'm gonna be going through the bibliographies later this week. So by the end of the week, 
I'll at least tell you how your works cited citations are looking. You don't have to have your works cited page done by the time we do peer review. And even if we if it is done, I'm not really asking any of you to evaluate each other's works cited pages. You don't need to do that even if your partner has one. So it's not a big deal if you haven't done your works cited page yet. But if your annotated bib is in good shape, if those citations are correct, and I'm telling you if they are or not when I give you feedback on that assignment, and, and if your citations are correct and you're still sticking with all of those same sources, then you don't need to rewrite those citations. Just cut and paste them from the bib into the paper, not the annotations. I don't want to read annotations anymore. We're done with those. At this point, you just need the correct works cited citations and if yours are correct cut and paste save yourself some time all right so take a look at some other stuff i posted in the main on the main page uh for the week 14 module you'll see my quote sandwich examples you'll see uh works cited page examples and you'll see a document with examples of different types of in-text citations so I'm trying to give you guys a lot of resources as we finish up our research. I mean, hopefully we're already done, but as we finish up our citations and just making sure all that stuff's looking good. So you can use those documents this week, but you might also be using them next week as we really finish up. So everything else is there. Use my outline, use all of my citation help. A lot of you aren't, a lot of you aren't always looking at my examples. Look at my examples. I'm showing you how all of your in-text citations should look and how your works cited page should look. So follow my examples, use my outline, start drafting, do peer review. And if you have any questions about any of this, let me know. Okay, and remember to CC me on the emails that you're sending with your partner. And again, hopefully by the end of this week, we have good rough drafts. And then next week, we turn those rough drafts into final drafts. And that's the last thing we're going to do. So get in touch with me if you have problems, questions, if you want to do another video conference. I know they were fun, and a lot of you would probably like to do another one Uh Kidding, of course, but if you need one, I can always schedule you another one. Okay, so let's talk. And if I don't hear from any of you this week, I'll talk to you one final time. Next week will be my final lecture. All right, good luck. And let me know if you're having issues with peer review. Okay. <laughs>